vascularized. Okay, it will be vascularized. What else can you tell me about it? Innervated? Yeah. So we're going to learn the free nerve ending stuff, and I'm going to teach you about the uh, Pacinian corpuscles, the Merkel discs, the Ruffini end bulbs, we're going to look at each of those, nervous system stuff, and the dermis. <coughs> What kind of tissue is it? It's irregular. It's irregular. And what do you mean by irregular? Um, if I'm going to describe a tissue, they're not like laid out perfectly. What's not laid out? No, I'm trying to the collagen. The collagen fibers. The arrangement of protein describes it, right? It's dense irregular, the dermis is, okay? So once I get underneath the dense irregular, what layer would I find next? Stratified squamous, dense irregular. What's next? I'm working my way down. We did each of these in the histo chapter, in, okay, in the histo section. The next layer down would be <coughs> fat, adipose tissue. Once the adipose tissue is off, what's next? A real or connected tissue. Fascia. Superficial fascia. I tear the superficial fascia off. What's next? Uh, no, we're not inside yet. We're still on the outside. Muscle. Yeah, skeletal muscle in most places. Okay, so I'm just, we're talking about skin, but I'm illustrating for you guys, you already know this. <coughs> if I was going to cut through, that's what I hit. Stratified squamous, dense irregular, adipose, areolar, fascia, muscle. This is what I go through as I work my way in anatomically. All right, let's do epidermis first. Epidermis is made up of Cells that contain keratin, you knew that. So about 80% of all the cells or more, at least 80% of all the cells are called keratinocytes because they're keratin-containing cells. Now, there are some other cell types here that I've not talked about in detail. One of those are the melanocytes, and I'm going to give you a little more information about them. Melanocytes along with keratin and hemoglobin determine skin color. The Lagerhorn cells are epidermal macrophages. I ask you, does the brain have resident macrophages? Yeah. <coughs> what are they called? Microbial, Microbial cells. Next question. Does the skin outer layer have resident macrophages? Yes, yes and they are called Langerhans or Langerhans cells. Good. Merkel cells are thought to be touch receptors. Epidermis is avascular and innervated. So two pieces of innervation you learned from me are free nerve endings, which we're going to talk about, and secondly, the Merkel cells in the basal layer of the epidermis. Now, I would like for you, I don't, I don't care for you to track parietal hyaline granules. I don't think that's really important for anatomy. It's enough to say the keratin is changing all of the cells of the epidermis start at the bottom. So we call this bottom layer of epidermis arguably the most important layer. This is where mitosis is occurring. This bottom layer of epidermis we call the basal layer or the stratum basale. On this basal layer or the stratum basale is where you will find the Merkel cells. You see it connected here to the nerve system. So that's touch receptor. And you will find the cell bodies of the melanocytes here in the basal layer. So we'll, we'll just touch very briefly on uh, <coughs> skin cancer as we're going through this. But the most dangerous kind of skin cancer is a melanoma. It is a cancer of the melanocyte. And you can see part of the reason for the danger of the melanoma is because of the location of this guy. If cancer cells are going to spread, they have to use the circulatory system to do that. 
So normally cancer cells are taken up, taken up by the lymphatic capillaries and then they metastasize or spread through circulation. That's what happens. Now, there are no blood vessels in the epidermis. So conceivably, the cancer that is boxed off in the epidermis would be of no threat to us. And so a lot of skin cancers, in fact, the two most common variety uh, of skin cancers, are found in epidermal layers. Uh, the squamous cell and the basal cell carcinomas are normally encapsulated there in the epidermis. They don't get into the blood supply. They typically, if you get them off of you, they typically don't bust through into the dermis, and so you just cut them off and you're done. These guys, uh, in part because of their location here, the melanocytes, are really dangerous because they, they grow very quickly. They break through the uh, basement membrane here um, very early in their development. They get into uh, the bloodstream and they, they find them way, their way all over the body, and make a mess of things um, all over the place. So melanocytes are in the basal layer. The Merkel cells are in the uh, strata basale. The next layer up in the uh, epidermis is called the stratum spinosum. This layer, the stratum spinosum, is where you normally find the Lagerhorn cells. So you're working your way out. These cells, I said this, but you, I pointed out to you again, these cells in the spinosum started here. So they divide off the basal layer and then migrate outward. So spinosum cells used to be basalic cells. And you'll find the longer hot cells here in the spinosum. Um, this is uh, the typical place for a squamous cell carcinoma. Um, they, they develop in this layer right here. Um, it is uh, a type of the most common, one of the most common, that one in the basal cell, are, are very common types of skin cancers. And they happen here in the spinosum. And you see it's a pretty thin layer. The cells don't really look flat there. <coughs> To me. Uh, the next layer up in thick skin is a layer called the stratum lucida. And it's not on this picture because it's in very limited locations. Normally on your scalp, here, palms of your soles of your feet, you have a, an extra layer here called the lucida. And it also stains clear normally with a typical hematoxylin stain, so you, it's difficult to see. So it's not on this picture. The next layer here is called the stratum granulosum, and you can see the granulated here cells of, of keratin. And then the final layer is normally um, 15 to 30 cell layers thick. This is why we define it as um, stratified squamous cells called stratum corneum, the outer layer of the corneum. Now there's a couple other things labeled here I wanted to point out to you that you've heard. You have heard, for example, already <clears throat> that um, there are specialized junctions in places in the human body. And I taught you about gap junctions, and we use the blood-brain barrier and the reproductive system as examples. And then I told you there are places in your body where desmosomes are used to connect cells. And one of those is in the skin, specifically in the layers of the stratum spinosa. Desmosomes really, remember, look like rivets in the bottom of a boat. There's a thick piece on either side and a rod between them. And that really gives some real strength. You can see them labeled here. You can, you can see all of them connecting here. The, the desmosome connections of the stratum spinosum are very famous. You see there aren't very many of them down here. So as you work your way into the spinosum, you see lots and lots of desmosomes um, in the layers of the epidermis. Okay, so the point of this picture was to point out to you the cell types here and their locations and to teach you the layers of the epidermis. Corneum, granulosum, lucidum, spinosum, basale, and some general characteristics and features where the cells are located in a layer of epidermis. All right, now, the next thing is dermis. So the dermis itself, I have some of this typed for you. The dermis itself is made up of two distinct layers. The top layer of dermis, which you can see protruding upward into the epidermis here, is called the papillary layer. And it's a very, it's a very thin layer here at the top of the dermis. Papillary dermis is normally used in discussions about fingerprints. 
So if you look at your hands, you look at your fingers, you can see ridges on your fingers. Those are ridges created by the arrangement of the collagen pressing outward into the epidermis, creating these ridges. Now, we think, at least I do, I don't know if you do, I think about those as being downward extensions. But textbooks, anatomy textbooks, describe these extensions as outward extensions of the dermis. And so learn it that way. This is the papillary layer of the dermis, the fingerprint layer of the dermis there. Now the rest of the dermis, the bulk of the thickness of the dermis is called the reticular layer of the dermis. And that's where most of the fun stuff is. You can see hair follicles extending down into the um, dermis. And I'm going to cut one so you can see it. What do you notice about the cells of the hair? There? Are they characters? Uh, yeah, are they epidermis or are they dermis? Yeah, hair is an epidermally derived tissue. Where is the hair root? In the dermis. It's in the dermis. Okay, so when you start talking about drugs that impact the way hair follicles behave, you have to talk about drugs that affect the blood vessels of the dermis that impact the roots of the hairs. Um, you can also see a bunch of nervous system stuff here, right? Can you see the free nerve endings here? Can you see these little encapsulated receptors? Make a note here. I'm going to point this out again in a table to you. Meisner's corpuscles, those are touch receptors. Are Meisner's corpuscles the shallowest touch receptor of skin? No. No. What are? The Merkel. Merkel cells or free nerve endings of the epidermis, yes? So really, free nerve endings extend all the way into the spinosum and granulosum of the epidermis. Now, if somebody were to touch your skin and they didn't actually make contact with it, they just brushed across the top of the hair, would you be able to detect that? Yes. Why? Okay, are there nerve endings out here in the hair? That's right. Can you see them wrapped around the end of the hair thing here? So you have these networks of sensory nerve endings around the bulbs, around the roots of the hair. So when you touch one, it makes action potentials down here in the dermis. So sensation comes from, if you touch the skin itself, from free nerve endings or Merkel discs. If you touch the hair, it comes from the from the hair follicle receptors, these plexuses that surround the hairs, or it comes from the shallow encapsulated receptors here we call Meisner's. Now, don't, don't consider this trivial. I'm going to come back to this again um, in a table to talk about the sensory pieces of the skin in just a little bit. Yes, question? Um, I'm just asking, when you get like waxes on and everything, does that damage the nerve ending? When you rip the root of the hair out, I think probably so. Because they're always saying that it gets easier, like it doesn't hurt as much the next time you do it. So. Oh, okay, well that may be some adaptation stuff as well. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. I'm not sure I can explain that. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been waxed. <laughs> okay. Okay, so as we work, work our way down here into the dermis, you can see some other, uh, let me point this out first. Um, you can see a Pacinian corpuscle here. Where is it in relation to the Meisner corpuscle? It's deeper. You see that? So that's going to be a major anatomical observation that we make. Um, these guys are shallow. These guys are deep. Now, we're also going to talk a little bit about adaptation um, on this and talk about, okay, so how would I know, are there receptors that would tell me the difference in this and this. And the answer is yes. And so I'm going to point that out to you. The one that's not shown in this picture that I'll point out to you are the Ruffini end bulbs, which tend to be deeper. But some, a lot of times you'll find them through the middle layers of the reticular layer of dermis. Touch things, encapsulated, free nerve endings. 
blood vessels are here. The hair root is here. Now, you can also see in this picture different kinds of glands. So this is labeled as an eccrine sweat gland. And the eccrine sweat gland is this coil-looking structure here with a duct that comes all the way out to the surface. It goes all the way through um, the dermal, reticular, papillary, and up through the epidermis, all the way to the surface of the skin to release sweat. The numbers of eccrine sweat glands in the skin are absolutely flabbergasting. In a cubic uh, centimeter of skin, you'll have tens of thousands of these guys. And they're more concentrated in some places than others. So I want to point that out to you. They have some cousins that normally develop after puberty in large numbers called apocrine glands, um, who release a little more thick, viscous solution, a little more cellular. That's what makes you stink. And then uh, you can see here that there are glands associated with hair follicles. So a lot of times, African glands will be associated with the hair follicles. And these guys here, called sebaceous glands, they're always associated with hair follicles. And they release, they're, they're not really technically a sweat gland. They're an oil-producing gland. And they're also sensitive to sex hormones. They develop more during puberty, so oftentimes when GnRH starts producing a lot of LH and FSH during the beginning and continuing stages of puberty. The sebaceous glands over secrete sebum, which will clog the pores of the hair, and they make a little environment here that doesn't cleanse, doesn't clear. And so you end up with dirt, bacteria, bacteria love dark, moist places. And the bacteria grow there, we call that acne. Um, it's actually, acne is actually the infection of a sebaceous gland. So oftentimes, the dermatologist will respond to that with an antibiotic for acne. And every other treatment is just a treatment to clean these, to cleanse the skin and to dry the sebaceous glands that are associated with the hair fall. So what's a sebaceous cyst? Is it? Oh. Um, a sebaceous gland that hasn't cleared. So it just stays. It encapsulates, and then a lot of times you have to cut them out um, to get the sebum out of the sebaceous gland. Yeah. Okay, now you can also see here that there are muscles associated with hair follicles, and I want to talk about them some as well. These are rectal pili muscles that are, they are, remember a second ago, it's just vaguely in your memory, I said most of the smooth muscle that we find in the body is arranged in sheets. But there are some weird ones that act a little bit more like skeletal muscles. This is one of them, the erector pili muscles. Um, their, uh, their nervous system innervation is connected to the autonomic nervous system. Um, they contract and cause, uh, they're always connected to the upper layers of the dermis and to the roots of the hair. So when they contract, they tend to cause the hair to stand up. And a lot of times, um, they, they will cause hairs to stand up that haven't yet made it through. Hairs that are growing up through the epidermis, not yet penetrated the outside of the skin, broken through. And the rectal pili muscles causes the hair to stand up, and it causes a bump on your skin. We call those goosebumps. So they have autonomic regulation. They're interesting also. OK, so as I said, the dermis um, includes um, two layers, a papillary and reticular layer. You know something about those. It won't surprise you to know that dermis is made of fibroblasts, right? This is connective tissue proper, dense, irregular connective tissue. And so these other cell types I listed before for you macrophages and mast cells and white cells also present in the layers of the dermis. Um, the hypodermis is underneath the dermis, and you know that it's composed of adipose. And then what's next, Taylor? Uh, a realer connective tissue, that's right. So you're working your way down from uh, to the bottom layers of the skin. Now, when we start next time, I'm going to give you a little better, um, a little better rendition of skin color. Your book will not have all this. <coughs> I'm interested. So always, you know, blather on about things that I'm interested in. 
And so I won't, I won't beat you up with this horribly, but there are, in my opinion, there's some things in skin color that can teach us anatomy in other places. So melanin is the major skin pigment, no doubt. And it has a variety of colors, and students ask, well, how can it be brown and orange and black? How is that all possible? So I'm going to show you. And then uh, we're going to talk, I'm going to give you a funny story about drinking carrot juice. And then hemoglobin, the hemoglobin story is the story of color all over you. It helps me introduce the distribution of blood and skin color. And it also explains a number of other things about color. Why does your skin turn yellow when your liver's not working? And the answer is here in the hemoglobin story. So I will use these three to talk about some other things that I'm interested in in class on Friday. We'll continue with skin.